Okay, well, we, we are now leaving the 60s and going into the 70s. And 1970, actually, I believe, uh, is when this one comes. It is The Carpenters, next to you. So, um, once again, um, not the easiest biography in the world, <laughs> the, the Carpenters, I'd say. Another tragic um, story. And... Uh, for sure, a tragic story. And, um, you know, I, 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 so instead of just doing the bio right off the bat, because I think a lot of my take is going to weave the bio into it, so I don't mm -hmm. want to be redundant kind of in what we're talking about because when I think of the Carpenters, right, in my limited knowledge of them, like okay. I kind of think of three things, right? Like brother-sister band, yep. right? So family band lineage. Number two, sold a metric shit ton of albums in like mm -hmm. the 1970s. Like basically did it despite not being on at any point, you know, like hip, right? Like they kind of just, they, well, and I'll go into that. They operate in this interesting lane of pop music <laughs> that yeah. I think that I, I want to talk about. And then of course, obviously, I think a lot of people know Karen Carpenter's tragic story, dying in her early thirties from anorexia, um, which is a harrowing story. Um, I shared with these guys this week, uh, the, the, version of superstar which is not on this album we're covering tonight by sonic youth which i just always felt was an incredible cover but also just sort of like just incredibly creepy because it yeah. it takes on a whole different meaning that almost like embodies karen carpenter herself and just um yeah it's one of my all-time favorite covers but uh, what would you say jo what was yours I, I, I like you know i like to lay my cards on the table because i know there's more to it and part of why i liked the idea that we were going to do an album from them was I could explore the music now instead of knowing more about the narrative than I know about yeah. the music, right? Yeah, the the narrative actually is like always overshadowed the music for me. Like I, I knew about that before. Probably I knew what songs they sang to the point that, uh, you know, when learning about eating disorders for the first time, like Karen Carpenter was like the example in some, in some respects. And um and later on too, um, the artist Todd Haynes did a did a um, kind of a student film called Superstar, where they tell he told the Karen Carpenter story, but through like Barbie dolls and like filming that. So it's very interesting. You can find it on YouTube. It's not there's no like official release of it because of the the content and kind of the way that it's been done. But it's very interesting. So I learned about that later as well. But still like that was like second kind of second to the music um, or that was before the music. So um, yeah. So yeah, it was good to it was good to come to this album and you know appreciate it through from a musical standpoint. Yeah. Um, so just to give a little bit of a run on this one, in the 1970s, the Carpenters are one of the biggest acts in music, especially in the early to mid 70s. They they win four Grammys. They have 12 top 10 hits. They have three number one singles. Jeez. Um, yeah, they're pretty gigantic as an mm -hmm. act, which I know because you just when you look at the charts and you know you just heard hear lots of people who the carpenters are one of their favorite bands ever but you also find tons of people that the carpenters don't even register at all with them and i think the reason is because the carpenters had kind of this vibe that yeah. of being uncool i think like when i was growing up if you said you were into the car even famous scenes in movies right have a little like the tommy boy scene right where oh, they're singing yeah. superstar kind of the joke is kind of like that they're singing the carpenters right, right. you know that they're uncool they kind of look at each other right yeah and so, and you know meme yeah. culture with like you know when uh, you know why do birds suddenly appear mm -hmm. you know it's just and uh it's kind of a shame because i i have always thought in in learning more about karen carpenter i think lots of people you know bring up a lot that her first love was drums and she was a pretty good drummer um, including playing all the drum parts on here and oh wow i didn't know that oh you did oh yeah no she's a yeah. she's a good now it's it's a little bit people will say oh she's one of the best drummer i, I wouldn't go that far but she's a she's a very good drummer and i do think there is a less sad alternate timeline where she becomes a female drummer right in mm -hmm. a rock band and maybe occasionally sings a song on the albums and people are like wow she can really sing but she's the drummer you know yeah. in a band and you know, not in front of the camera and behind the camera where I think it just seems like she would have been more comfortable in many ways. And, um, you know, and this is where I bring up 
Linda Ronstadt, Josh, because you mentioned earlier that you could see her being influenced by Patsy Cline. I could also see another alternate timeline where like Karen Carpenter has like Linda Ronstadt's career mm -hmm. because singing wise and, and their roots, right? They have some similarities um, along the way. Um, and, you know, both of them have voices that I think really appeal to people uh, because of sort of their calmness and directness. It's pretty mm -hmm. voices, I'd say. Yep. Um, so that was kind of something I was thinking about as we listened to this album, but let me just quickly give a little bit of a background here on the Carpenters. Um, they formed in the late 1960s in Downey, California. They were originally from New Haven, Connecticut. When I say they, it's Richard Carpenter and Karen Carpenter. As we mentioned, they were, uh, they were siblings. Mm -hmm. Um, Richard was a guitar player who had been like sort of a nightclub guitar player in Connecticut. Um, family moves to California and he begins to study piano formally um, and Karen is playing in a trio with him and another gentleman named Wes Jacobs. Um, Jacobs and Richard sort of Richard Carpenter sort of formed the band for Karen and she gets signed to a California record label called Magic Lamp. Um, they're being sort of marketed as her right so it's her and them mm -hmm. as the background band. Uh, but the trio ends up winning a Battle of the Bands contest at the Hollywood Bowl in 1966, which gets them a record contract with RCA. At this point, they're under the name the Richard Carpenter Trio. So it's interesting. It shifts all the way the other way now. Right. It's Richard Carpenter. And Jacobs ends up leaving the group in 1968, so they become a two-piece. Um, the siblings uh, then form a band called Spectrum with a friend of Richard's from college, John Bettis, but that falls apart. And then they finally decide to perform as a duo. Um, they go perform some demos at the house of a studio musician named Joe Osborne. And then, and this is interesting because I was just mentioning this guy to my father the other day uh, when I was up there, the tape was directed to Herb Alpert. He of oh, the yeah. Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass. Yeah. Now, the reason he, who signs them to his record label in early 1969. Now, the reason Herb Alpert came up to me is there is a gentleman who on YouTube has been putting up these videos of like every number one album or every song that hit number one ever. And he's up to like every song that peaked at number eight ever, right? Stuff like that. Okay. And what I learned in listening to the one about number one was that Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass had a lot of number one albums in the 1960s. It was kind of shocking because it was sort of like for a while, it was like Beatles, Herb Alpert, Beatles, Herb Alpert, oh, Beatles, Herb Alpert. Then it was like Rolling Stones. Then there was a year where the Monkees, right? Had a couple, but yeah. Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass was sell moving some products man so um and he's the the head of a&m records something i don't think i knew and i'm a little embarrassed about that he was the head of that but yeah he signs them in early 1969 and they release an album called offering um offering has a beatles cover as the album we're covering tonight has on that one it was ticket to ride on this one it's help um it gets them attention for it um but then uh, the second single, which is They Long To Be Close To You, which is on this album, is the breakthrough, Close To You comes out, and it becomes the band's first number one single, spends four, uh, four weeks at the top of the chart, and Close To You becomes a big hit both in the United States and internationally. And, yep, and they win Best New Artist in 1970 and two Grammys that year. That's right, John. The other... The thing is, I, I was like, why is Herb, Herb Alpert sound so familiar recently? It's because Jerry Moss just died and he was mm. the co found as of like last week. Um, he died and he's the co founder of AM with Herb Alpert. So that's why they're paired together in my mind recently. Yeah. yeah and, and basically, the, the Carpenters just keep churning out number one hits. Um, some songs that are, a lot of them that are not on this, like Goodbye to Love, Superstar, Rainy Days and Mondays, mm. Top of the World, among others. Uh, and then uh, they get their fourth number one hit only yesterday in 1975. But then the band's popularity begins to decline somewhat with changing sounds, but also Richard basically has picked up a prescription drug habit. Uh, Karen uh, has picked up, unfortunately, has become afflicted with, I guess I should say, anorexia. Um, and while Richard is eventually able to kick the prescription drugs, um, Karen is not able, unfortunately, to... Um, be able to to mm. overcome the anorexia uh, karen goes out on a solo career in 1979 
um, and there's some hits, but they reunite in 1981. But unfortunately, uh, it just never kind of comes back again because of the the decline in Karen's health. And mm -hmm. um, eventually, unfortunately, on on February 4th, 1983. She is uh, found dead from cardiac arrest. Um, and Richard Carpenter continues throughout the 80s. He releases some solo albums. Uh, they have a couple posthumous albums of sort of cobbled together material. But that was sort of the end of the group at that point, sadly. So they, they yep. rose like a like a big star. And then unfortunately, sort of the star started to, to burn out a little bit. Um, I feel like, unfortunately, there's just so many of these sad stories that um, we're having in these. Well, albums. Richard Carpenter's still alive, so that's yes. Thing. Yeah. Yes. No, and I know. I just feel like I, I've ended yeah. it with, and then an, an <laughs> right. untimely death. It's like it's been a theme tonight for various. Yeah, reasons. really. Yeah. So, um, but let's let's talk about the album now. Um, what do you think? Well, it's it's certainly a shift in in sound. I think that's the other kind of reason why I think they were uncool is is their sound is very soft rock, um, gentle, a folksy sound, and that this album is is no uh, um, outlier from that. The big standout tracks on here would be "We've Only Just Begun," and which I think has been used in a million. Um, <laughs> movies or a million point. and one yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they long to be close to you those would be the two that i think people would recognize off this one but yeah you i mean you run down all those other hits um that they had that they are not on this album but again like like the previous two artists we talked about um not familiar with this album and just demonstrates kind of the the um the the power and and the singularity of of Karen Carpenter's voice. She has a she has a strength to her, but also um, an in, uh, enticing feel and um, and singularly her own. And it also is backed by Richard Carpenter, who has a pretty good voice himself. And then this this strong orchestral backing um, as by well. By the way, Karen Carpenter is all of 20 years old on this album. Oh my gosh, okay. Which I should bring up, yep. Yeah, that's crazy. They were, they were so young. What's the age difference between the two of them? It's funny. I'm actually, I just okay. looked up. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking right now. Let's take a look. So this was 1970. So he was born in 1946. So he would have been 24. So it looks okay. like a four-year age difference. Yeah, so quite, quite young for both of them. And... Uh, and uh yeah it's it highlights once again the the studio is highlighting both of their voices and feel i feel like has the full power of um putting not only um strong session musicians behind them but also kind of the best in the game in terms of songwriting um and covers with uh burke backrack and hal david um uh, being songwriters on many of the songs on this album and uh, you know their choice of covers as well with things like help um, that obviously the Beatles um, originated and and um, I think there's some other covers as well but I'm uh, reason to believe I think is a cover as well so it's a uh, kind of a, a lush production it's it's gentle it's inviting sound um, it's definitely like in the soft rock lane they when they do kind of have originals on here like on the uh, on the back half like crescent noon and and mr gooder which is a homage i guess to a um a uh a former boss that they had and or that richard had and uh another song i think that's original as well um i think i think it, i guess my point is that it shows kind of the the strength of not only their voices but um, their songwriting chops and kind of their uh, arrangement about Richard Carpenter's arrangement ability as well I really like the arrangements on here um, it was it was a good listen it's not really like I don't think it's uncool but it's not really kind of like my un genre of music it's a bit too uh, dreamy and soft for me but I enjoyed listening to the album and um what did you think about it? It's funny because, like, as I was listening, I said, you know, there's this whole page of popular music in right. the 70s, right, of these artists that – and I start writing down a list, right, and of just 
people like Barry Manilow, Neil Diamond, Paul Anka, right? Um, All artists who probably uh, sold a ton of albums. Debbie Boone, <laughs> the Osmonds. Yeah, that, that sold jillions of albums, right? Were yep. considered square, right? Yep. Kind of had ironic comebacks to lesser degrees, right? Like the Osmonds sort of reinvented themselves as so wholesome. Mm -hmm. It's can't help but like them, you know what I mean? And, you know, Debbie Boone, you know, became in the world of Christian music, right? Like Neil Diamond, you know, had the Sweet Caroline and just sort of, you know what I'm saying? Like all yep. these different people, like just kind of, uh, that exist outside of my realm of music because it's not usually my lane of music. And it's funny. So I, I like wrote down all of these artists and then I was like, oh, I'm just out of curiosity. Let's see how close it is. And I go to like similar to, and it's hilarious. It's like all of those. <laughs> yeah. And then they added like, uh, they added some others too that I, I would not have thought. Like Captain and Tennille, right? Was oh, one yeah. that they put in there. Mm -hmm. And um, Petula Clark was in there. And I'm like, yep. And they did mention another one that I thought was interesting because the other one connected a little bit more with me. They mentioned Carol King and there are some elements of what Carol King was doing yeah. um, in this. I, I just think maybe the, the, the songs and the groove was a little bit more uh, for me in terms of that. But yeah, it's just, it's amazing. And even in the influenced category, it's like, boy, this is just similar lane, but the sixties version of it, right? Like Burt Bacharach and Judy Collins and mm -hmm. stuff like that. I'm like, wow. Um, and it just reminded me that, you know, pop music is such an interesting uh, diaspora, right, of different sounds, because what could be something that doesn't appear at all to me, but I just know it could be basically someone's entire listening catalog of the 70s, and not just someone, like a lot of people, probably right. all those acts I just mentioned is basically their album drawer you know yeah. of what's listening so and i think all these you know all of the these artists would have been on the radio a lot and and would have you know covered that whole like pop radio sound but i feel like, like am radio is yes. where you would have found yeah it's yeah. and to me am and fm is sort of like the arbiter of cool right in the 70s right if you're on fm radio i just for whatever reason i feel like you're a little cooler right if you're on am radio it's sort of like playing for the masses and that's not a knock and it's in this day and age probably if you were to play certain stuff for people in gen z right now that the wholesomeness right and sort of the straight aheadness and the sentimentality is there they probably would lean more to the am sound right um <laughs> and am and fm is probably such a foreign concept to a lot of uh, right yeah listeners. if they weren't like, saying what the hell are you yeah you saying yeah that mm -hmm. would be um it'd be a whole other show explaining how radio i mean works. even for us as we're growing up am had yeah. become a you know political and sports talk and religious radio right you're, yeah they you're didn't really even play music on am right. radio yeah it was point. already i mean we know it by the legacy right of people right. talking and and you know commercials for like am gold and yes. stuff growing yeah, up definitely. But, yeah. but like it wasn't a thing right for even us and we're mm -hmm. you know not young bucks anymore or anything like that but let me kind of talk about the album a little bit more um i was kind of in the middle on this um it was already going to be a tough genre for me because sound wise yeah um it, it's not really my lane um it is a little bit edgeless i'd yep. say um and and that can be tough for me I, I think if you're making edgeless music i need something to to take it over the top um I, I, the the help cover fell flat for me <laughs> yeah I it didn't work I, for me either yeah i don't know if that one I, I think they just were big fans of the beatles and you know they did ticket to ride and it was received yep. well so that was sort of a chance to do that um the two big hits you know we've only just begun and they long to be close to you are big hits because they are very catchy well-constructed pop songs um they're probably the strongest tracks on the album i'd say mm -hmm. by quite a bit it's also interesting that they're the variety of run times of these songs isn't it you've got tracks that are as long as 433 and you've got tracks that are short as like 159 you don't see too many albums that have uh, not a consistent timing you know yeah. like at the beginning it's it's almost like metronomic it's like four of the first five tracks are either 303 or 304 right with one 159 but then it's 433 250 257 410 and 315 followed by 214 and 423 so mm -hmm. you think you're going to kind of get like a steady conveyor belt right of a certain length and certain song and then it's like nope we're going to start free you know free flowing in a little bit more um i do like the contrast of karen carpenter and richard carpenter's voices um yep. i think 
the fact that he comes in on some of the tracks is a is welcome even though i like karen carpenter's voice better i do think changing it up a little bit helps the album quite a yeah. bit it's another yeah, complimentary to each other their voices they are as you would hope for like yeah. a two-piece right that's mm -hmm. kind of you know you know whether it be simon and garfunkel or right. any others right you, you hope their voices are complimentary but it's another album that's mostly love songs um mm -hmm. our third of three that we've covered so far that's not a barrier again but whenever i get nothing but love songs i'm inevitably looking for someone to, to give me something else um within it and i do think that was a little a, a little bit of a barrier for me um a, a late gem for me later in the album was mr gooder i did like that quite a bit it stood out to me on the back end of the album mm -hmm. uh and, and i would probably say that was my third favorite track on the album but I have to kind of put this one in the slight thumbs down, I think. Um, it just didn't transcend transcend for me. Uh, it was always going to be a tough ask because while I appreciate what the Carpenters do, um, I kind of think I, 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 I do need whatever that coolness vibe is yeah. that they're not giving off a little bit. And uh, I don't like myself for saying that, but I, I think it is a little bit of a barrier to me. It also for me sounds very of its time like i said some of this very wholesome straight ahead music is coming back i think it's coming back though in a way that doesn't speak to me <laughs> it speaks to like another uh generation you know yeah. and so it, it it hasn't swept me up along the way so yeah this this you know this album from the 19 from 1970 does sound old-fashioned for 1970 i yes. think um and that's well that's even the, the photos you know they look old-fashioned yeah on it, yeah. yeah but i guess i would if i were alive in 1970 i would probably thought this was square as well um but yeah i i guess i'm I, i'm in agreement with you i appreciated listening to it but it didn't knock my socks off and there wasn't anything that that was here that maybe um transcended kind of like the genre and the and and them as an artist other than maybe their voices but yeah so um it was the rare instance i think of what i thought i was gonna get lined up with what i got um and i i like to think i'm pretty open-minded but um i think i was looking for something to pop out that would challenge me but it was sort of like if i'd written down what will you expect from a Carpenter's album? I think I would have wrote down a couple songs that I know that are pop standards mm. and a lot of sort of sentimental, wistful, delicate, ball you know, ballads with, with a couple covers. And that was pretty much exactly what I got. So, yep. Yep. Yeah, I guess the final point I would make is, is like you said, we're, we were able to, I appreciate being able to cover an album that was, you know, in that sphere that we that was just outside of our orbit in terms of pop albums that sold a ton that we didn't <laughs> that was kind of in this whole other uni alternate universe of or parallel universe of um things that were popular that we didn't cover yeah it's um i i did like that the last track was them attempting to make a rock song too that mm -hmm. interested me a little bit and you know i was listening out for karen carpenter's drums on this album because i know it's a piece of it and if you're going to listen for them that's the song where they're going to pop out uh, and for re the record that's uh, another song is the name of 